Hello everyone and welcome to this mini lecture series on feature engineering. So what this is about is the question how to transform data in a way, in a clever way, manually, automatically, in order to make better use of, of machine learning techniques. And before we start, let's consider the simplest class of models that we have studied also extensively um, more in the beginning of this course, which is the class of linear models, right? So what we oftentimes use, and we will see that this is actually a very, very powerful class if we combine this with, with features. So linear models are of the form that some output y is generated by a linear mapping of the input z. Right? So this could be your system state at a given time point and it's mapped to the system state at the next time point. Could also be a classification task, you know, identifying some dynamical behavior, you know, I don't know, rainy road versus dry road and driving or whatever. So you have an input and you have this linear transform that maps it to an output. All right. And so there are many, many advantages to linear models, right? First of all, they are easy to train. Right, we have seen uh, a lot of details on, on least squares and, and all sorts of variants of least squares, but it always boils down to solving a closed form system. So the training process is usually very easy. The next thing is that it's also usually very data efficient. Right, so a linear model means that the number of parameters that we need to train tends to be small, linear relationships can be modeled very easily. So we usually do not require large amounts of training data to find a good model that generalizes well, okay? And a third thing that can be seen as very positive is that in many cases, this model class allows for some sort of interpretability. Okay, so it doesn't have to be always the case, but oftentimes if, let's say this is a classification problem, then the weights in your W vector will tell you how important particular inputs of Z are in order to determine the output. So it's not, you know, not very clearly interpretable all the times, but usually you get some sort of idea which term of the input matters most. And so interpretability is very, very useful in particular for engineering systems where we also interested in, in system security and so on. However, here's the problem. The big drawback is that these models can be very limited in terms of what they can express, right? And this is, I guess, not a surprise. A linear relation does not always exist and in most complicated dynamical systems or real life dynamical systems exhibit nonlinear behavior. So the question is, how, what can we do, right? Um, if you think about, let's say this is a classification task now as an example, and you have the X's are one class and the O's are another class, then we see that in this setting very easily, you can find a linear separation. Okay, so good enough. But as I said, this is limiting because oftentimes what we will have is that we have relations like this, okay? So maybe you will find additional points of now the, the, the one, the, the, the positive class, let's say the circles around this, so that a linear model is clearly not sufficient to find, you know, a classification or in dynamic settings proje project or predict the state of a system in a linear fashion is not always useful. And so, well, do we need to go to nonlinear models or do we, can we do something, something else, okay? And so the question that we need to ask here is linear model, but linear with respect to what? Okay, so if you think about this, usually people say, okay, it's linear because the Z enters in a linear fashion. But this is not actually what matters to us in training. In training, it matters that there's a linear dependency in terms of the W, of the weight vector. So the linearity of Z doesn't matter. Right? 
right? It's all about the linearity in the weights. Which is very good, you know, because we can simply do anything we want with the transformation and still use the linearity in W, okay? So what we will do is, and this is what feature engineering really means, we introduce a potentially nonlinear, it can also be linear, so let's put a bracket around this, but can also be a nonlinear transform. And so this nonlinear transform is what we're going to call psi, psi of z, right? So some function that transforms z to some other space. And this is what we will call features. And right, this is very, very powerful. So let's go back to this example and consider one particular feature. So let's draw the same plot once more. But let's say that our feature vector, psi of z, is going to be z1 squared and z2 squared. Right? So our new coordinate system becomes psi1 of z and psi2 of z. And now you see, you know, this is essentially sort of a radius if you wish, right? So these points that are close by will have a smaller squared component in terms of z1 and z2. So these axes may appear, I don't know, somewhere here. Right? It's just a rough guess now. And in the same fashion, the O's have a larger radius. So they will appear somewhere here maybe. Right? I don't know specifically, but you know, you get the idea, I guess, right? So these features basically encode a transform into, into polar coordinates. And so all of a sudden our linear model is not so limited anymore, right? We have found a linear separation not on Z but on the features that we have selected. And so this mini-series is going to be all about, about these features. What we're doing now is Y is W transposed Psi of Z. And the question is now, how do you get these features? How do we select features in a clever way? And how can we learn something useful out of these feature transformed input data? Okay, and so let's close this video with the types of features that exist. And we will discuss these in detail in the upcoming videos. So what are types of features? Okay, so the easiest thing, or well, not the easiest thing, but if you have system knowledge and the most popular thing in terms of, of engineering systems is to use expert knowledge. You know, if an engineer has been working on a system their entire life, then maybe they know what to use, right? So you can use some features like the energy of a system. You might use the momentum of a system. And so all sorts of quantities that the expert knows uh, matters to, to identifying the system or to identifying important relationships, this can be used. But of course this reaches uh, its limitations if you know, the system is overly complicated or if an expert is not available maybe but just a data set. So different things that you can do instead is you can define dictionaries of features. Right, so this means a bunch of monomial terms or radial basis functions. You can use Fourier modes. So standard features or basis functions that can be used for, for function approximation in general as well. And so the details will be discussed in a video to come. And what you can also do is you can try a data-driven identification, right? So collect data and identify features automatically. And you can do so in, in, in a linear fashion. This is why I put the non in brackets. You can also do the psi in, in a linear form. So what we've seen already, the singular value decomposition is, for instance, a way to find these singular vectors and express your data in terms of these 
basis functions, which are then features. You can use nonlinear versions um, in the same way. These are encode autoencoders. So neural network extensions of the singular value decomposition, if you wish. There are kernel methods and so on. So there's actually quite a lot one can do. I'm not going to, to try to, to make a complete list out of this, but these are the things that are really important. And so let's close this video with one discussion about the dimension. Okay, so the dimension of our psi of z. Okay, so do we increase the dimension or do we reduce the dimension or do we leave it the way it is? Right here we map from 2D to 2D. And so this is an important question, which, um, or let's put it like this maybe, um, an important question, it matters uh, very much and has to do with the application that you're interested in. So what you can do is you can put this as the dimension itself, okay? So this would be the setting here. You do not increase the dimension, neither decrease it, just find a transformation that is more useful in terms of, of linearly separating two classes or something like this. You can also increase the dimension. Right? So let's say, assume we would not have gone to polynomials of degree two, but at cubic terms, z3, z, z2 to the power of three and so on. So this would mean an increase in dimension, which we will call a lifting to a higher dimensional space in the hope of finding linear relationships in these higher dimensional spaces. What you can also do is you can go down with the dimension in order to compress your information, right? We use the singular value decomposition to find the dominating singular vectors, which meant we expressed most of inform our information in terms of this lower dimensional basis. And so this really depends on the application you have in mind and also on the system structure that you have and whether there exists a low dimensional space in which the, the dynamics behave or whether you need a lifting in order to linearize otherwise nonlinear dynamics. So this is really the expertise that you need to bring along in the end. Okay, so this concludes our first video on, on feature engineering, and we are going to follow up with videos on dictionaries, on linear data-driven methods, and also on neural network-based approaches. Thanks a lot, and see you in the next video.